Chapter One of Genji Monogatari. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Moira Fogarty. Genji Monogatari by Murasaki Shikibu, translated by Suimatsu Kencho. Chapter One: The Chamber of Kiri. In the reign of a certain emperor, whose name is unknown to us, there was, among the Nyogo and Koyi of the imperial court, one who, though she was not of high birth, enjoyed the full tide of royal favor. Hence her superiors, each one of whom had always been thinking, I shall be the one, gazed upon her disdainfully with malignant eyes, and her equals and inferiors were more indignant still. Such being the state of affairs, the anxiety which she had to endure was great and constant, and this was probably the reason why her health was at last so much affected, that she was often compelled to absent herself from court, and to retire to the residence of her mother. Her father, who was a Dainagon, was dead, but her mother, being a woman of good sense, gave her every possible guidance in the due performance of court ceremony. So that in this respect she seemed but little different from those whose fathers and mothers were still alive to bring them before public notice. Yet, nevertheless, her friendliness made her oftentimes feel very diffident from the want of any patron of influence. These circumstances, however, only tended to make the favor shown to her by the emperor wax warmer and warmer, and it was even shown to such an extent as to become a warning to after generations. There had been instances in China in which favoritism such as this had caused national disturbance and disaster, and thus the matter became a subject of public animadversion, and it seemed not improbable that people would begin to allude even to the example of Yo Ki Hi. In due course, and in consequence, we may suppose, of the divine blessing on the sincerity of their affection, a jewel of a little prince was born to her. The first prince who had been born to the emperor was the child of Koki Danyogo, the daughter of the Udaijin, a great officer of state. Not only was he first in point of age, but his influence on his mother's side was so great that public opinion had almost unanimously fixed upon him as heir apparent. Of this the emperor was fully conscious, and he only regarded the new born child. With that affection which one lavishes on a domestic favorite. Nevertheless, the mother of the first prince had, not unnaturally, a foreboding that unless matters were managed adroitly, her child might be superseded by the younger one. She, we may observe, had been established at court before any other lady, and had more children than one. The emperor, therefore, was obliged to treat her with due respect. And reproaches from her always affected him more keenly than those of any others. To return to her rival, her constitution was extremely delicate, as we have seen already, and she was surrounded by those who would fain lay bare, so to say, her hidden scars. Her apartments in the palace were Kiritsubo, the chamber of Kiri, so called from the trees that were planted around. In visiting her there, the emperor had to pass before several other chambers, whose occupants universally chafed when they saw it. And again, when it was her turn to attend upon the emperor, it often happened that they played off mischievous pranks upon her at different points in the corridor, which leads to the imperial quarters. Sometimes they would soil the skirts of her attendants, sometimes they would shut against her the door of the covered portico. Where no other passage existed, and thus, in every possible way, they one and all combined to annoy her. The emperor at length became aware of this, and gave her for her special chamber another apartment, which was in the Koroden, and which was quite close to those in which he himself resided. It had been originally occupied by another lady, who was now removed, and thus fresh resentment was aroused. When the young prince was three years old, 
the Hakamagi took place. It was celebrated with a pomp scarcely inferior to that which adorned the investiture of the first prince. In fact, all available treasures were exhausted on the occasion, and again the public manifested its disapprobation. In the summer of the same year, the Kiritsubo Koyi became ill and wished to retire from the palace. The emperor, however, who was accustomed to see her indisposed, strove to induce her to remain. But her illness increased day by day, and she had drooped and pined away until she was now but a shadow of her former self. She made scarcely any response to the affectionate words and expressions of tenderness which her royal lover caressingly bestowed upon her. Her eyes were half-closed. She lay like a fading flower in the last stage of exhaustion, and she became so much enfeebled that her mother appeared before the emperor and entreated with tears that she might be allowed to leave. Distracted by his vain endeavors to devise means to aid her, the emperor at length ordered a tegruma to be in readiness to convey her to her own home, but even then he went to her apartment and cried despairingly, Did not we vow that we would neither of us be either before or after the other even in travelling the last long journey of life? And can you find it in your heart to leave me now? Sadly and tenderly looking up, she thus replied, with almost failing breath, Since my departure for this dark journey makes you so sad and lonely, fain would I stay though weak and weary, and live for your sake only. Oh, had I but known this before! She appeared to have much more to say, but was too weak to continue. Overpowered with grief, the emperor at one moment would fain accompany her himself, and at another moment would have her remain to the end where she then was. At the last her departure was hurried, because the exorcism for the sick had been appointed to take place on that evening at her home, and she went. The child prince, however, had been left in the palace, as his mother wished, even at that time, to make her withdrawal as privately as possible, so as to avoid any invidious observations on the part of her rivals. To the emperor the night now became black with gloom. He sent messenger after messenger to make inquiries, and could not await their return with patience. Midnight came, and with it the sound of lamentation. The messenger, who could do nothing else, hurried back with the sad tidings of the truth. From that moment the mind of the emperor was darkened, and he confined himself to his private apartments. He would still have kept with himself the young prince now motherless, but there was no precedent for this, and it was arranged that he should be sent to his grandmother for the morning. The child, who understood nothing, looked with amazement at the sad countenances of the emperor and of those around him. All separations have their sting, but sharp indeed was the sting in a case like this. Now the funeral took place. The weeping and wailing mother, who might have longed to mingle in the same flames, entered a carriage, accompanied by female mourners. The procession arrived at the cemetery of Otagi, and the solemn rites commenced. What were then the thoughts of the desolate mother? The image of her dead daughter was still vividly present to her, still seemed animated with life. She must see her remains become ashes to convince herself that she was really dead. During the ceremony, an imperial messenger came from the palace and invested the dead with the title of Sami. The letters patent were read and listened to in solemn silence. The emperor conferred this title now in regret that during her lifetime he had not even promoted her position from a koyi to a nyogo, and wishing at this last moment to raise her title at least one step higher. Once more several tokens of disapprobation were manifested against the proceeding, but in other respects the beauty of the departed and her gracious bearing, which had ever commanded admiration, made people begin to think of her with sympathy. 
It was the excess of the emperor's favor which had created so many detractors during her lifetime. But now even rivals felt pity for her, and if any did not, it was in the Koki den. When one is no more, the memory becomes so dear, may be an illustration of a case such as this. Some days passed, and due requiem services were carefully performed. The emperor was still plunged in thought, and no society had attractions for him. His constant consolation was to send messengers to the grandmother of the child, and to make inquiries after them. It was now autumn, and the evening winds blew chill and cold. The emperor, who, when he saw the first prince, could not refrain from thinking of the younger one, became more thoughtful than ever. And on this evening he sent Yugai no Myobu to repeat his inquiries. She went as the new moon just rose, and the emperor stood and contemplated from his veranda the prospect spread before him. At such moments he had usually been surrounded by a few chosen friends, one of whom was almost invariably his lost love. Now she was no more. The thrilling notes of her music, the touching strains of her melodies, stole over him in his dark and dreary reverie. The Myobu arrived at her destination, and, as she drove in, a sense of sadness seized upon her. The owner of the house had long been a widow, but the residence in former times had been made beautiful for the pleasure of her only daughter. Now, bereaved of this daughter, she dwelt alone, and the grounds were overgrown with weeds, which here and there lay prostrated by the violence of the winds, while over them, fair as elsewhere, gleamed the mild luster of the impartial moon. The Myobu entered, and was led into a front room in the southern part of the building. At first the hostess and the messenger were equally at a loss for words. At length the silence was broken by the hostess, who said, Already have I felt that I have lived too long, but doubly do I feel it now that I am visited by such a messenger as you. Here she paused, and seemed unable to contend with her emotion. When Naishi no Suke returned from you, said the Myobu, she reported to the emperor that when she saw you face to face, her sympathy for you was irresistible. I, too, see now how true it is. A moment's hesitation, and she proceeded to deliver the imperial message. The emperor commanded me to say that for some time he had wandered in his fancy, and imagined he was but in a dream and that, though he was now more tranquil, he could not find that it was only a dream. Again, that there is no one who can really sympathize with him, and he hopes that you will come to the palace and talk with him. His majesty said also that the absence of the prince made him anxious, and that he is desirous that you should speedily make up your mind. In giving me this message, he did not speak with readiness. He seemed to fear to be considered unmanly, and strove to exercise reserve. I could not help experiencing sympathy with him, and hurried away here, almost fearing that perhaps I had not quite caught his full meaning. So saying, she presented to her a letter from the emperor. The lady's sight was dim and indistinct. Taking it therefore to the lamp, she said, Perhaps the light will help me to decipher and then read as follows, much in unison with the oral message. I thought that time only would assuage my grief, but time only brings before me more vividly my recollection of the lost one. Yet it is inevitable. How is my boy? Of him, too, I am always thinking. Time once was when we both hoped to bring him up together. May he still be to you a memento of his mother, such was the brief outline of the letter, and it contained the following. The sound of the wind is dull and drear across Miyagi's dewy lee, and makes me mourn for the motherless deer that sleeps beneath the hagi tree. She put gently the letter aside, and said, 
Life and the world are irksome to me, and you can see, then, how reluctantly I should present myself at the palace. I cannot go myself, though it is painful to me to seem to neglect the honoured command. As for the little prince, I know not why he thought of it, but he seems quite willing to go. This is very natural. Please to inform His Majesty that this is our position. Very possibly, when one remembers the birth of the young prince, it would not be well for him to spend too much of his time as he does now. Then she wrote quickly a short answer, and handed it to the Myobu. At this time her grandson was sleeping soundly. I should like to see the boy awake, and to tell the emperor all about him, but he will already be impatiently awaiting my return, said the messenger, and she prepared to depart. It would be a relief to me to tell you how a mother laments over her departed child. Visit me then, sometimes, if you can, as a friend, when you are not engaged or pressed for time. Formerly, when you came here, your visit was ever glad and welcome. Now I see in you the messenger of woe. More and more my life seems aimless to me. From the time of my child's birth, her father always looked forward to her being presented at court, and when dying he repeatedly enjoined me to carry out that wish. You know that my daughter had no patron to watch over her, and I well knew how difficult would be her position among her fellow maidens. Yet I did not disobey her father's request, and she went to court. There the emperor showed her a kindness beyond our hopes. For the sake of that kindness, she uncomplainingly endured all the cruel taunts of envious companions. But their envy ever deepening, and her troubles ever increasing, at last she passed away, worn out, as it were, with care. When I think of the matter in that light, the kindest favors seem to me fraught with misfortune. Ah, that the blind affection of a mother should make me talk in this way! The thoughts of His Majesty may be even as your own, said the Myobu. Often when he alluded to his overpowering affection for her, he said that perhaps all this might have been because their love was destined not to last long, and that though he ever strove not to injure any subject, yet for Kiritsubo and for her alone he had sometimes caused the ill-will of others, that when all this has been done she was no more. All this he told me in deep gloom, and added that it made him ponder on their previous existence. The night was now far advanced, and again the Myobu rose to take leave. The moon was sailing down westward, and the cool breeze was waving the herbage to and fro, in which numerous mushi were plaintively singing. The messenger, being still somehow unready to start, hummed, Fain would one weep the whole night long, as weeps the Sudumushi's song, who chants her melancholy lay, till night and darkness pass away. As she still lingered, the lady took up the refrain. To the heath where the Sudumushi sings, from beyond the clouds one comes from on high, and more dews on the grass around she flings, and adds her own to the night wind's sigh. A court dress and a set of beautiful ornamental hairpins, which had belonged to Kiritsubo, were presented to Myobu by her hostess, who thought that these things, which her daughter had left to be available on such occasions, would be a more suitable gift, under present circumstances, than any other. On the return of the Myobu, she found that the emperor had not yet retired to rest. He was really awaiting her return, but was apparently engaged in admiring the Tsubo Tsenzai, or stands of flowers, which were placed in front of the palaces, and in which the flowers were in full bloom. With him were four or five ladies, his intimate friends, with whom he was conversing. In these days his favorite topic of conversation was the long regret. Nothing pleased him more than to gaze upon the picture of that poem, which had been painted by Prince Taishi In, or to talk about the native poems on the same subject, which had been composed, at the royal command, by Ise, the poetess, 
and by Tsurayuki, the poet. And it was in this way that he was engaged on this particular evening. To him the Myobu now went immediately, and she faithfully reported to him all that she had seen, and she gave to him also the answer to his letter. That letter stated that the mother of Kiritsubo felt honored by his gracious inquiries, and that she was so truly grateful that she scarcely knew how to express herself. She proceeded to say that his condescension made her feel at liberty to offer him the following. Since now no fostering love is found, and the hagi tree is dead and sere, the motherless deer lies on the ground, helpless and weak, no shelter near. The emperor strove in vain to repress his own emotion, and old memories, dating from the time when he first saw his favorite, rose up before him fast and thick. How precious has been each moment to me, but yet what a long time has elapsed since then, thought he. And he said to the Myobu, How often have I, too, desired to see the daughter of the Dainagon in such a position as her father would have desired to see her. Tis in vain to speak of that now. A pause, and he continued, The child, however, may survive, and fortune may have some boon in store for him, and his grandmother's prayer should rather be for long life. The presents were then shown to him. Ah, thought he, could they be the souvenirs sent by the once lost love? as he murmured, Oh, could I find some wizard sprite, to bear my words to her I love, beyond the shades of envious night, to where she dwells in realms above. Now the picture of beautiful Yokihi, however skillful the painter may have been, is after all only a picture. It lacks life and animation. Her features may have been worthily compared to the lotus, and to the willow of the imperial gardens, but the style, after all, was Chinese, and to the emperor his lost love was all in all, nor, in his eyes, was any other object comparable to her. Who doubts that they, too, had vowed to unite wings and intertwine branches? But to what end? The murmur of winds, the music of insects, now only served to cause him melancholy. In the meantime, in the Kokiden was heard the sound of music. She who dwelt there, and who had not now for a long time been with the emperor, was heedlessly protracting her strains until this late hour of the evening. How painfully must these have sounded to the emperor! Moonlight is gone, and darkness reigns, e'en in the realms above the clouds. Ah, how can light or tranquil peace! Shine o'er that lone and lowly home. Thus thought the emperor, and he did not retire until the lamps were trimmed to the end. The sound of the night watch of the right guard was now heard. It was five o'clock in the morning. So to avoid notice, he withdrew to his bedroom, but calm slumber hardly visited his eyes. This now became a common occurrence. When he rose in the morning, he would reflect on the time gone by, when they knew not even that the casement was bright. But now, too, he would neglect morning court. His appetite failed him. The delicacies of the so-called great table had no temptation for him. Men pitied him much. There must have been some divine mystery that predetermined the course of their love, said they, for in matters in which she is concerned, he is powerless to reason, and wisdom deserts him. The welfare of the state ceases to interest him. And now people actually began to quote instances that had occurred in a foreign court. Weeks and months had elapsed, and the son of Kiritsubo was again at the palace. In the spring of the following year, the first prince was proclaimed heir apparent to the throne. Had the emperor consulted his private feelings, he would have substituted the younger prince for the elder one. But this was not possible, and, especially for this reason, there was no influential party to support him, and moreover, public opinion would also have been strongly opposed to such a measure, which, if effected by arbitrary power, 
would have become a source of danger. The emperor, therefore, betrayed no such desire, and repressed all outward appearance of it. And now the public expressed its satisfaction at the self-restraint of the emperor, and the mother of the first prince felt at ease. In this year, the mother of Kiritsubo departed this life. She may not improbably have longed to follow her daughter at an earlier period, and the only regret to which she gave utterance was that she was forced to leave her grandson, whom she had so tenderly loved. From this time the young prince took up his residence in the imperial palace, and next year, at the age of seven, he began to learn to read and write under the personal superintendence of the emperor. He now began to take him into the private apartments, among others, of the Kokiden, saying, The mother is gone. Now, at least, let the child be received with better feeling. And if even stony-hearted warriors, or bitter enemies, if any such there were, smiled when they saw the boy, the mother of the heir apparent, too, could not entirely exclude him from her sympathies. This lady had two daughters, and they found in their half-brother a pleasant playmate. Every one was pleased to greet him, and there was already a winning coquetry in his manners, which amused people and made them like to play with him. We need not allude to his studies in detail, but on musical instruments, such as the flute and the koto, he also showed great proficiency. About this time there arrived an embassy from Korea, and among them was an excellent physiognomist. When the emperor heard of this, he wished to have the prince examined by him. It was, however, contrary to the warnings of the emperor Wuda to call in foreigners to the palace. The prince was, therefore, disguised as the son of one Udaiben, his instructor, with whom he was sent to the Korokwan, where foreign embassies are entertained. When the physiognomist saw him, he was amazed, and turning his own head from side to side, seemed at first to be unable to comprehend the lines of his features, and then said, His physiognomy argues that he might ascend to the highest position in the state, but in that case his reign will be disturbed, and many misfortunes will ensue. If, however, his position should only be that of a great personage in the country, his fortune may be different. This Udaiben was a clever scholar. He had with the Korean pleasant conversations, and they also interchanged with one another some Chinese poems, in which one of the Korean said what great pleasure it had given him to have seen before his departure, which was now imminent, a youth of such remarkable promise. The Koreans made some valuable presents to the prince, who had also composed a few lines, and to them, too, many costly gifts were offered from the imperial treasures. In spite of all the precautions which were taken to keep all this rigidly secret, it did, somehow or other, become known to others, and among those to the Udai Jin, who not unnaturally viewed it with suspicion, and began to entertain doubts of the emperor's intentions. The latter, however, acted with great prudence. It must be remembered that, as yet, he had not even created the boy a royal prince. He now sent for a native physiognomist, who approved of his delay in doing so, and whose observations to this effect the emperor did not receive unfavorably. He wisely thought to be a royal prince, without having any influential support on the mother's side, would be of no real advantage to his son. Moreover, his own tenure of power seemed precarious, and he, therefore, thought it better for his own dynasty, as well as for the prince, to keep him in a private station, and to constitute him an outside supporter of the royal cause. And now he took more and more pains with his education in different branches of learning, and the more the boy studied, the more talent did he evince, talent almost too great for one destined to remain in a private station. Nevertheless, as we have said, suspicions would have been aroused had royal rank been conferred upon him, and the astrologists, whom also the emperor consulted, having expressed their disapproval of such a measure, the emperor finally made up his mind to create a new family. To this family he assigned the name of Gen, 
and he made the young prince the founder of it. Some time had now elapsed since the death of the emperor's favorite, but he was still often haunted by her image. Ladies were introduced into his presence, in order, if possible, to divert his attention, but without success. There was, however, living at this time a young princess, the fourth child of a late emperor. She had great promise of beauty, and was guarded with jealous care by her mother, the Empress Dowager. The Naishi Nosuke, who had been at the court from the time of the said emperor, was intimately acquainted with the empress, and familiar with the princess, her daughter, from her very childhood. This person now recommended the emperor to see the princess, because her features closely resembled those of Kiritsubo. I have now fulfilled, she said, the duties of my office under three reigns, and as yet I have seen but one person who resembles the departed. The daughter of the Empress Dowager does resemble her, and she is singularly beautiful. There may be some truth in this, thought the Emperor, and he began to regard her with wakening interest. This was related to the Empress Dowager. She, however, gave no encouragement whatever to the idea. How terrible, she said. Do we not remember the cruel harshness of the mother of the heir apparent, which hastened the fate of Kiritsubo? While thus discountenancing any intimacy between her daughter and the emperor, she too died, and the princess was left parentless. The emperor acted with great kindness, and intimated his wish to regard her as his own daughter. In consequence of this, her guardian, and her brother, Prince Hyob Kyo, considering that life at court would be better for her and more attractive for her than the quiet of her own home, obtained for her an introduction there. She was styled the Princess Fujitsubo of the Chamber of Wisteria, from the name of the chamber which was assigned to her. There was indeed, both in features and manners, a strange resemblance between her and Kiritsubo. The rivals of the latter constantly caused pain, both to herself and to the emperor, but the illustrious birth of the princess prevented any one from ever daring to humiliate her, and she uniformly maintained the dignity of her position. And to her, alas, the emperor's thoughts were now gradually drawn, though he could not yet be said to have forgotten Kiritsubo. The young prince, whom we now style Genji, the Gen, was still with the emperor, and passed his time pleasantly enough in visiting the various apartments where the inmates of the palace resided. He found the companionship of all of them sufficiently agreeable, but beside the many who were now of maturer years, there was one who was still in the bloom of her youthful beauty, and who more particularly caught his fancy, the Princess Wisteria. He had no recollection of his mother, but he had been told by Naishi Nosuke that this lady was exceedingly like her and for this reason he often yearned to see her, and to be with her. The emperor showed equal affection to both of them, and he sometimes told her that he hoped she would not treat the boy with coldness, or think him forward. He said that his affection for the one made him feel the same for the other too, and that the mutual resemblance of her own, and of his mother's face, easily accounted for Genji's partiality to her. And thus, as a result of this generous feeling on the part of the emperor, a warmer tinge was gradually imparted both to the boyish humor and to the awakening sentiment of the young prince. The mother of the heir apparent was not unnaturally averse to the princess, and this revived her old antipathy to Genji also. The beauty of her son, the heir apparent, though remarkable, could not be compared to his and so bright and radiant was his face, that Genji was called by the public Hikal Genji no Kimi, the shining Prince Gen. When he attained the age of twelve, the ceremony of Gembuk, or crowning, took place. This was also performed with all possible magnificence. Various fetes, which were to take place in public, were arranged by special order, by responsible officers of the household. 
the royal chair was placed in the eastern wing of the Serio Den, where the emperor dwells, and in front of it were the seats of the hero of the ceremony, and of the Sadaijin, who was to crown him, and to regulate the ceremonial. About ten o'clock in the forenoon, Genji appeared on the scene. The boyish style of his hair and dress excellently became his features, and it almost seemed matter for regret that it should be altered. The Okurakyo Kurahito, whose office it was to rearrange the hair of Genji, faltered as he did so. As to the emperor, a sudden thought stole into his mind. Ah! Could his mother but have lived to have seen him now! This thought, however, he at once suppressed. After he had been crowned, the prince withdrew to a dressing-room, where he had tired himself in the full robes of manhood. Then, descending to the courtyard, he performed a measured dance in grateful acknowledgment. This he did with so much grace and skill that all present were filled with admiration, and his beauty, which some feared might be lessened, seemed only more remarkable from the change. And the emperor, who had before tried to resist them, now found old memories irresistible. Sadaijin had by his wife, who was a royal princess, an only daughter. The heir apparent had taken some notice of her, but her father did not encourage him. He had, on the other hand, some idea of Genji, and had sounded the emperor on the subject. He regarded the idea with favor, and especially on the ground that such a union would be of advantage to Genji, who had not yet any influential supporters. Now all the court and the distinguished visitors were assembled in the palace, where a great festival was held. Genji occupied a seat next to that of the royal princess. During the entertainment, Sadaijin whispered something several times into his ear, but he was too young and diffident to make any answer. Sadaijin was now summoned before the dais of the emperor, and, according to custom, an imperial gift, a white o uchiki, grand robe, and a suit of silk vestments were presented to him by a lady. Then, preferring his own wine cup, the emperor addressed him thus, In the first hair knot of youth, let love that lasts for age be bound. This evidently implied an idea of matrimony. Sadaijin feigned surprise and responded, I, if the purple of the cord, I bound so anxiously, endure. He then descended into the courtyard and gave expression to his thanks in the same manner in which Genji had previously done. A horse from the imperial stables and a falcon from the Kuran Dokoro were on view in the yard and were now presented to him. The princes and nobles were all gathered together in front of the grand staircase, and appropriate gifts were also presented to each one of them. Among the crowd, baskets and trays of fruits and delicacies were distributed by the emperor's order, under the direction of Udaiben, and more rice cakes and other things were given away now than at the gambuk of the heir apparent. In the evening, the young prince went to the mansion of the Sadaijin, where the espousal with the young daughter of the latter was celebrated with much splendor. The youthfulness of the beautiful boy was well pleasing to Sadaijin, but the bride, who was some years older than he was, and who considered the disparity in their age to be unsuitable, blushed when she thought of it. Not only was this Sadaijin himself a distinguished personage in the state, but his wife was also the sister of the emperor by the same mother, the late empress, and her rank therefore was unequivocal. When to this we add the union of their daughter with Genji, it was easy to understand that the influence of Udaijin, the grandfather of the heir apparent, and who therefore seemed likely to attain great power, was not, after all, of very much moment. Sadaijin had several children. One of them, who was the issue of his royal wife, was the Kurand Shioshio. Udaijin was not, for political reasons, on good terms with his family, but nevertheless he did not wish to estrange the youthful Kurand. 
On the contrary, he endeavored to establish friendly relations with him, as was indeed desirable, and he went so far as to introduce him to his fourth daughter, the younger sister of the Kokiden. Genji still resided in the palace, where his society was a source of much pleasure to the emperor, and he did not take up his abode in a private house. Indeed, his bride, Lady Aoi, Lady Hollyhock, though her position ensured her every attention from others, had few charms for him, and the Princess Wisteria much more frequently occupied his thoughts. How pleasant her society, and how few like her, he was always thinking, and a hidden bitterness blended with his constant reveries. The years rolled on, and Genji, now being older, was no longer allowed to continue his visits to the private rooms of the princess as before. But the pleasure of overhearing her sweet voice, as its strains flowed occasionally through the curtain casement, and blended with the music of the flute and koto, made him still glad to reside in the palace. Under these circumstances, he seldom visited the home of his bride, sometimes only for a day or two after an absence of five or six at court. His father-in-law, however, did not attach much importance to this, on account of his youth, and whenever they did receive a visit from him, pleasant companions were invited to meet him, and various games, likely to suit his taste, were provided for his entertainment. In the palace, Shigesa, his late mother's quarters, was allotted to him, and those who had waited on her waited on him. The private house where his grandmother had resided was beautifully repaired for him by the Shuritakmi, the imperial repairing committee, in obedience to the wishes of the emperor. In addition to the original loveliness of the landscape and the noble forest ranges, the basin of the lake was now enlarged, and similar improvements were effected throughout with the greatest pains. Oh, how delightful would it not be to be in a place like that, which such an one as one might choose, thought Genji within himself. We may here also note that the name Hikal Genji is said to have been originated by the Korean who examined his physiognomy. Footnotes Footnote 2 The beautiful tree, called Kiri, has been named Polonia Imperialis by botanists. Footnote 3 Official titles held by court ladies. Footnote 4. The name of a court office. Footnote 5. A celebrated and beautiful favorite of an emperor of the Thang dynasty in China, whose administration was disturbed by a rebellion, said to have been caused by the neglect of his duties for her sake. Footnote 6. A Nyogo who resided in a part of the imperial palace called Kokiden. Footnote 7. The Hakamagi is the investiture of boys with trousers when they pass from childhood to boyhood. In ordinary cases, this is done when about five years old, but in the royal family it usually takes place earlier. Footnote 8. A carriage drawn by hands. Its use in the courtyard of the palace was only allowed to persons of distinction. Footnote 9. Cremation was very common in these days. Footnote 10. A court lady, whose name was Yugai, holding an office called Myobu. Footnote 11. Miyagi is the name of a field which is famous for the hagi, or lespedeza, a small and pretty shrub which blooms in the autumn. In poetry it is associated with deer, and a male and female deer are often compared to a lover and his love, and their young to their children. Footnote 12. In Japan there is a great number of mushi, or insects, which sing in herbage grass, especially in the evenings of autumn. They are constantly alluded to in poetry. Footnote 13. In Japanese poetry, persons connected with the court are spoken of as the people above the clouds. Footnote 14. A famous Chinese poem by Hak Rak Ten. The heroine of the poem was Yoki He, to whom we have made reference before. The story is that after death she became a fairy, 
and the emperor sent a magician to find her. The works of the poet Pe Lo Tien, as it is pronounced by modern Chinese, were the only poems in vogue at that time. Hence, perhaps, the reason of its being frequently quoted. Footnote 15. There were two divisions of the imperial guard, right and left. Footnote 16. The general name for a species of musical instrument resembling the zither, but longer. Footnote 17. In these days, imperial princes were often created founders of new families, and with some given name, the gen being one most frequently used. These princes had no longer a claim to the throne. Footnote 18. The ceremony of placing a crown or coronet upon the head of a boy. This was an ancient custom observed by the upper and middle classes, both in Japan and China, to mark the transition from boyhood to youth. Footnote 19. Before the crown was placed upon the head at the gembuk, the hair was gathered up in a conical form from all sides of the head, and then fastened securely in that form with a knot of silken cords, of which the color was always purple. Footnote 20. The color of purple typifies, and is emblematical of, love. Footnote 21. A body of men who resembled gentlemen at arms, and a part of whose duty it was to attend to the falcons. End of chapter 1 Recorded in Toronto, Ontario, by Moira Fogarty, September 2008